Isaiah chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 1 through 15, and we're going to be thinking about uh, the entire context of this passage. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 15, as we think about the advent of Christ, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 15, uh, the sermon's title, She Will Call His Name Emmanuel. This is a reading of the public reading of God's holy word. Give careful and reverent attention to it. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and his hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son Shir Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And say to him, Take care and be calm, have no fear, and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and, uh, and Aram and the son of Ramalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now, within another 65 years, uh, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. Uh, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Amen. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Well, in our passage uh, today, you know, it's one of the most famous verses that embodies the Christmas message. Verse 14, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Uh, This verse really wonderfully summarizes the entire Christian story, that the God-man would be humbled, born of a virgin, and accomplish the work of our Savior to reconcile the sinner to God. Well, today I want us to delve into why this passage is so famous, why this verse is so famous, and to soak in especially God's marvelous plan of salvation for us. And so one of the most beautiful things about our God is that he does have a relationship with us. He doesn't just uh, speak from a tower up above, decrees from heaven, with no care or consideration with us, with what we're experiencing. This fact alone makes Christianity completely unique compared to all the religions of the world. He actually has a relationship with us with you, with me. He speaks to his people, words of comfort, to guide, to promise. And all of the Bible asserts to this fact. So when we look at this prophecy that a, that a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, I want us to understand the context of this. Right? Oftentimes we'll just look at that one verse and sort of uh, that'll be it. But I want us to look at the context of this. And understand that Christians did not come up with the idea of the virgin birth out of the blue. Right? This prophecy was born out of a terribly difficult time in Israel's history. And God gave this promise out of a special purpose for his beloved children. Now to get there though, we're, we're going to unpack a little bit of the context of what's happening. And rather again, to, to jump into Isaiah 7.14, what's going on historically speaking? What is this terrible, difficult time in Israel's history? Well, as we're reading from verses 1 through 13, I would imagine there's a lot of unfamiliar and vague names. 
right? There's probably a lot of names that are um, or vaguely recognizable, but that's, it, it's kind of complicated. Uh, and so it's hard to sort of catch the significance of what's happening in our passage. So let me sketch out with words a picture of what's actually going on. Uh, by this time, the unified kingdom, Israel, used to be called, right, that unified kingdom was called Israel, but eventually split into two different nations, two different kingdoms. The north retained the name of Israel, and the south was called Judah. Right? The northern kingdom, being Israel, sometimes took the name Ephraim. And so these two kingdoms, right, these two nations of God's singular people, Israel and Judah. And what we have is Judah having suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Israel, their brother nation. In fact, in one day, Israel killed 120,000 people, soldiers in Judah. Right? One day, 120,000 people. That's a lot of people, especially when you think about the kind of weapons they were using, arrows, swords, clubs, and shields. So despite perhaps a primitive sort of weapon, 120,000 people dying. To lose so many soldiers is a significant loss. Now, 2 Chronicles 28 gives us a reason for the crushing defeat by Judah. And we're told there, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And so we see the southern kingdom forsaking God. Right? That was the problem. Compounding this issue was the fact that King Ahaz, the king of Judah of the south, He's one of the most wicked kings that all of uh, Judah had known. A really, really bad king. And throughout 2 Chronicles 28, we're told that he's, what he did was constantly set up idols in order to worship uh, Baal. He went so far as to sacrifice his own children as part of that worship. Right? He sacrificed them to Baal. And so Ahaz is a terrible, terrible and wicked man. Now, in addition to this crushing defeat by the north, right, by Israel, Judah was also involved in a costly war with another northern kingdom, another northern nation called Aram. Right? And so it's only getting worse here. And they've just been defeated by Aram. Now, both of these kingdoms, both of these nations with their kings, King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel, what winds up happening is they form an alliance, these two nations. And they say, you know what? We're going to attack Judah. Now, why would Israel form an alliance with this pagan kingdom to attack Judah? Well, Israel and Aram, they become one. Solidarity in their anger towards Judah. Why? Well, there's another kingdom called Assyria. And they're a massive threat. You know, some people have compared Assyria to the Nazis in World War II. A massive threat, and they were a devastating nation. And so what Aram and Israel was hoping for was that Judah would join them to form a coalition, sort of a triumvirate, to help defeat or help defend themselves against Assyria. All right. Well, what does Judah say? Judah says no. Judah says no. And as a result, you have Aram and Israel uh, sort of tag-teaming themselves and saying, we don't like Judah now. And so we're told in chapter 7, verse 2, that when the house of David found out that they were now going to attack them, the hearts of Ahaz, right, the king, and the hearts of the people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. I mean, this is very, very frightening and terrifying what's happening here, right? They're terrified, justifiably so, and they thought, we're in massive trouble. We don't stand a chance. The two countries that defeated us individually, now they're coming together as one. Oh, we're going to get annihilated. All right, what can we do? Well, God being rich in mercy extends to the house of David, right, to Judah, ray of hope in verse 3. The Lord tells Isaiah, right, the prophet Isaiah, take your son to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to Washerman's Field different verse and at that time that's where the city's water supply was and Ahaz was probably checking it out to make sure there's enough water for the people just in case 
the invading army cuts them off from water. And so with verse 4 until the end of our passage, God then uses Isaiah to give words of comfort even to the sinful and wicked king. Isaiah tells a fearful and worried King Ahaz, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. He sends his word, a word of promise, a word of assurance, a word of reassurance, a word from God that should bring comfort and ease, that God will bring about deliverance. But of course, how often we hear, even for ourselves, comforting words from God, but what do we do? We wind up denying the power of those words. Think about what's about to happen. You want us to keep calm in the light of this kind of persecution? You want us not to be afraid in light of the fact that we're about to get annihilated? Right? Easy to say, but hard to do. Isn't that something that, again, we say to ourselves so often? What are you talking about, Isaiah? You're expecting me to be calm and not to be afraid. That sounds pretty dumb. Don't you know that these are the same two countries that were so devastating? And yet to say to keep calm and not to be afraid makes no sense at all. And you might be thinking on the one hand that, you know, well, an army attacking. I live in the States. Not really afraid of that. Doesn't really sound relevant to me. Well, these words spoken to a king from David's house, the chosen people long ago in the land of promise. It may feel that this threat is irrelevant. And yet, those same emotions of anxiety, those same emotions of fear that the people of Judah felt can easily lead us in the exact same way to doubt God's presence, to doubt God's protection. We're never immune, no matter when and where we live. 40 million adults we find out even today, which is almost 20% of the adult population in our country battle anxiety one out of 20 suffer uh, one out of 20 children also suffer from anxiety or depression and even if we don't have clinical depression if we're honest we are never that far removed from our next worry from our next fear and so god our covenantal god who has a personal relationship with each of us sends a word of comfort. And I want you to recognize the power behind God's word here. The word of God, as Isaiah 55, 11 says, will not return to him empty. And 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those being saved, it's the power of God. The word of God, do you recognize the power of God's word? And God sends this word to Judah through the prophet Isaiah. And although Ahaz's wickedness is almost unsurpassable, God sends Isaiah to him to deliver words of comfort. Isaiah persists in comforting Ahaz in verse 4. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Right? In other words, have you seen a, a burnt out campfire? Right? The stubs of wood that are left there, they're whittled down. Right? There's not much left. Right? They're, they're not uh, something that is threatening. They're about to be burned out. And Isaiah says it's the same thing of these two kings from these two nations. They're just a couple of what? Burnt out stubs of wood. Don't worry about them. They can't hurt you anymore. And you know what? Eventually we see he was right. A year later, 2 Kings 15.30 tells us the king of Israel has died. The year after that, the king of Aram was murdered by the invading armies of Assyria. And just as God said, they were burnt out stubs. Why, you might be asking, is God so staunch in protecting Judah? Right? Why isn't he helping Israel through all of this? What's important to recognize is that as corrupt as Ahaz might be, as wicked as the people may have become, It's not God preferring one kingdom over the other or one people over the other, but you have to see what's at stake here. As we approach this story, in fact, the entire Old and New Testament, you have to understand that a spiritual warfare is going on. 
that the hand of Satan and his counterfeit sovereignty moves behind the scenes. The reason for this kind of persecution upon Judah, it's not just about warring nations. It's not just about tribalism here. Satan is doing something to extinguish the line of David with the thought of destroying the promise of God to keep the Messiah from being born. And that has been Satan's plan all along. And that's what's happening here in our passage. The kings of Aram and Israel probably not even aware of what's happening. But Satan is strategic in moving to destroy the house of David. And by killing Ahaz, annihilating Judah, there, uh, as a result, would no longer be a house of David, and as a result, no longer be a house of no Messiah, no Savior, no salvation, and no heaven. See, that promise that God said in 2 Samuel 7, that promise that God said in Genesis 3.15, that, that goes all the way back there. When God issues that promise, it will not be broken. God is not a man that he should lie. This conflict is not just about one nation against one nation. It's about the kingdom of Satan against the kingdom of God. And that's what's at play here. So the stakes are enormous. The stakes of what's happening here are enormous. And so the Lord is giving to Ahaz an incredible offer. An incredible and amazing offer. And it's easy to overlook, but understand how overwhelming and breathtaking it actually is. It's one of the greatest offers that you will find God giving to any person in the Old Testament. Because in addition to the word of promise he's already given, not to be afraid. Ahaz is told, ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. In other words... Ask me for anything that you want. And I will do it to prove my trustworthiness to you. Ask for me any kind of sign that you want. And I will do it. It is an incredible and amazing offer that God gives to Ahaz. To prove his own trustworthiness. It's not enough that God says, I'm God. But he now says, I will give you a sign on top of the fact that I am God, on top of the fact that my word is good enough. I will give you a sign to prove my trustworthiness to you. I want you to understand how overwhelming and breathtaking this offer is to Ahaz. But I want you to see as overwhelming and breathtaking this offer is, how does Ahaz respond to this? What does he do with this offer? In essence, what he does with this, what he does with this reassurance by God, verse 12, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Do you understand what he's saying when he says this? God is telling him, I'm going to do anything for you. I will do anything for you. His response, though, isn't just no. His response is, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. I want you to see, he's actually quoting Deuteronomy. But in doing so, he takes the words of Deuteronomy out of context. And what he does is he throws God's words back in his face. And I want you to understand is there is an incredible, self-righteous, self-righteous hypocrisy that is going on with him. He uses God's words to throw it back to him. Despite God giving him this amazing offer, he says that he will not ask. He cloaks his unbelief in hypocritical piety. When he says, I'm not going to test the Lord, what he really means, I don't trust you, God. And I'm not going to trust you no matter what you've said to me. And I want you to really think about this even for yourself. How often God continues to give you words of reassurance in his word over and over again. But our response so often, well, you know what, God? And we like to cloak our piety in hypocrisy. Or we like to cloak our hypocrisy in piety. We like to assume this sense of humility when in fact the self-righteousness is through the roof. 
Instead of trusting God, Ahaz had already decided in his heart to place his trust in whom? What does Ahaz actually trust? In the king of Assyria. Psalm 121, verse 1 says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountain from where shall my help come from? For Ahaz, the answer was Assyria. For Ahaz, he decided that he would try and create an alliance with the Assyrians. Rather than trust God, instead, he would rather submit to the Assyrians. Rather than outright refusing the offer of salvation, Ahaz, would rather trust what he can see. Again, think of it even in this way. If we were to illustrate it, imagine if you were told by your best friend or significant other. Maybe your parent. Maybe your child. That you wanted to give a sign of your love, an expression of your devotion to them. And he or she refused because someone else's friendship and love was preferred instead. This is what Ahaz has done to God. Anything you want, but rather than just an outright no, it's almost like this passive-aggressive preference for someone else. This brings us to the heart of our passage then, and I want you to understand what's happening with uh, Isaiah 7.14. God's response to Ahaz, the way that God responds to Ahaz in verse 14 Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a son. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Despite Ahaz's refusal, we see God is faithful. Even with this rejection by his people, God is long-suffering and patient. God will be faithful even when humanity is not. God will keep his promises even when humanity refuses to trust him. And this gets to the point that Ahaz, Ahaz, even while he was faithless, even when he refused to trust God, even when he refused to trust his word, we see that Satan, and ultimately, is unable, as cunning as he is, unable to undo God's promise. And we see God saying, this is the sign. God will provide a seed of the woman in the most radical sense and do what he says in verse 14. A virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. God promises that despite the faithful or faithlessness of his people, despite the devious plotting by Satan, despite our rejection, he will still nonetheless provide a sign. With this incredible promise during this Christmas season, lift your eyes from yourselves. Yes, enjoy the seasonal merrymaking, but see beyond yourselves. And don't be blind to the essential reason for our Christmas joy. For those who may find the holiday season difficult, perhaps because you're suffering with depression or loss, Lift your eyes of faith to the sign that he has given to you as he offers you a word of hope and comfort. Isaiah 7.14 again declares, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. God himself condescends to give you a sign. God himself enters the world that he would be that sign to you. So that he would preserve his faithfulness to you. So that that promise that he gave from the beginning, from back in Genesis 3, he says, I will be that sign to you. And we see that. The further meaning of that salvation in in, uh, Isaiah chapter 11. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire and his resting place shall be glorious. The idea of the root of Jesse, the son of Jesse, a king like David, will be a sign that God will give us a true king like David. So that the opening chapters of Matthew, the opening chapters of uh, the New Testament, we see Jesus born, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The promise of God has come. 
The promise of God has come. The entire genealogy of Christ is proof that God has always had this plan. And Satan is unable to undo this plan. We are unable to undo this plan. That no matter how much Aram, Israel, Judah, sin, No matter how much Satan strives, nothing would stop God's promise from being fulfilled. What's fascinating is that in Matthew, that genealogy in chapter 1, you'll see that it includes the dreadful Ahaz. That even with Ahaz, God's promise cannot be stopped. God promised a son, and even with Ahaz's unfaithfulness, God will fulfill that promise. And so Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, what we read uh, as the opening of worship. Now all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Do you hear that? Those words, God with us. God is saying, I will be with you, even when things look bleak, even when things look hopeless, since I will be with you, since I will never forsake you. Stop being afraid. All of history attests to this, that nothing will stop God's faithfulness to you. Nothing will stop God's affections from being displayed and demonstrated upon you. Not even your own sin. How do you know? Look at the sign that God gives you. I myself in the flesh will be with you is what God is saying. God comes to you in the flesh to be with you. God comes to you. Rather than you coming to him, he comes to you. Even when you refuse to come to him, he comes to you from another world even. That there is no distance by which he refuses to come to you. And he gives himself. Do you understand this? God is saying through this sign, I give myself to you. Myself, even when no one else will give themselves to you. Even when others abandon you or you abandon you. God intervene and declares, Emmanuel, I will be with you. I will never abandon you. And God declares that despite your shakiness of even your faith in him, worrying of the future, worrying what will happen, God's promise will still be fulfilled. And we see then it's not dependent upon us. It's not dependent even upon your ability to trust. But your salvation is a miracle that God himself has brought forth. Just as it is impossible for a virgin birth to, uh, to occur, it is impossible for you to gain true salvation from your sins by anything you could do. It took something for God to do outside of our own ability. The virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is a sign of God's faithfulness even when we are not. Now here's the thing as we learn about this additional fact about this child. This child born of a virgin, we're told in verse 15, will eat curds and honey. We tend to sort of stop at verse 14, but that's why I included verse 15. And we're told that he will endure much sorrow and much grief. This child will endure much sorrow, much grief. And it's a fitting way for us to conclude today's sermon. As wonderful as it is to remember the birth of our Lord, to meditate on why God gave himself to us, how God became a man, we can never forget why God did this, why he gave himself to us in the first place. It's not just that God became a man, but why? Why did he do this? And we're told in verse 15 to eat curds and honey, to endure grief and sorrow. Again, why? 
to undergo to undergo the judgment that we deserve. Right? Sounds a little bit depressing, but it's actually very, very welcoming. You see, because this child would undergo grief and sorrow, suffering upon himself the judgment and curse of our sin, that is why God can be with you in the first place. The sign that was rejected by Ahaz, the sign of salvation that was rejected by Ahaz, he wanted someone he could see with his eyes, not believe by faith. When God offered a sign of his faithfulness to Ahaz, Ahaz refused because he wanted something tangible. This mindset by Ahaz in rejecting God, we see over and over again, even for us in the story of our uh, Savior. You catch a glimpse of this mindset and attitude in John 19, 15, when Pilate was about to crucify Jesus. The people of the crowd responded away with him. We don't want this guy. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. My faith, my hope, my trust is in Caesar, not in him. I have no hope but Assyria, not you, God. See, with Christmas approaching, I want to ask you, what kind of sign is it that you seek? See, like Ahaz, do you put your hope in the world? In your own version of Assyria. I have no king but Caesar. See, like the crowds who crucified Jesus, do you prefer the security that this world offers? That this world seems to provide? Again, your own version of Caesar over Christ. Who or what? has become your Assyria? Who or what has become your Caesar? Who or what has become your king? Who or what has become your hope? Who or what has become your comfort in this life? When you have your own arams enclosing about you, do you look to the sign that God himself has given to you when he gave himself to you? Or is it something else that you're seeking? to be the hope and comfort of your life. See, children of God, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, but today. God has worked patiently and lovingly throughout the ages to bring about a complete salvation for you. And he offers you this gift of salvation through his son, Christ Jesus. Rather than hiding behind hypocrisy, Rather than having our false piety cloak our hypocrisy, let us instead respond with the true joy and thankfulness for what God has accomplished. Isaiah 12 proclaims, Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is your midst in the Holy One of Israel. The reason for why we sing. Why do we sing these beautiful Christmas songs? Why do we come together and worship this day? Because God has given us the greatest sign and gift of his love. The greatest demonstration of his faithfulness as he has given himself to you. The greatest gift of all. It's the giving of himself, the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel. Then let us gift our own lives to one another. Let us gift our own lives unto him, that we might serve him, we might love him, that we might give our entire selves, that we might go to him in this way in response. Yes, when we think about Christmas, God has given himself to us. He has given you that sign. Struggle not no more but trust what he has done for you. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you. As we're reminded of the great promise that you have made and the accomplishment of this promise, and we begin to see how all of the Bible fits together, that this entire system of Scripture, we see it fit together as we see the prophecy fulfilled, as we see it work together, and why God, in establishing a relationship with us, you gave yourself to us. Through the virgin birth, you gave yourself to us. And we thank you, Lord, for your love, your affection, your adoring us. 
that now we see what you have done, that we would respond with the same kind of adoration by giving ourselves no less. Lord, indeed, as you have gifted yourself to us, we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to one another. That even as we come from all various nations, tribes, and tongues, we give ourselves to one another. That in this way, it would be a true expression then of what our Lord has done for us. We do love you. We thank you. And we pray that we would uh, take time this week then to sing praises, the glory of the coming of God in this world that we might demonstrate that in our love for you and love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.